And this is the lesson from yesterday and today. It's about version control with Git. And I will soon zoom in. I just want to give you the big picture for today. We will first, I want to first point you out that we have this episode here about configuring your Git command line or editor if you need it. So during the first exercise, we will give you the choice to, to either try VS Code or to try the command line. And if you haven't set it up uh, before the workshop, uh, you can then have a look at this configuration episode. And this will be the only place today where you will need it. And if it doesn't work, don't worry. You can then watch what we do. And the rest of today, you can continue on GitHub. Also, yesterday, we have uh, covered three episodes. We have started from an existing project. We created some commits and branches. And we have then merged these branches. And we have discussed a little bit how contributing to projects could look like. Today, we will cover four episodes. There will be three exercises. There will be one exercise in the first hour, second exercise in the second hour. We will then take a longer break. And then there will be a third exercise in the third hour. In the first hour, we will start with cloning a Git repository and working on it locally. In the second hour, we will we will explore this toolbox of how, how we can inspect a repository created by somebody else. This will be a really fun exercise. And then we will conclude today with be able to share our own work, uh, turning it into a Git repository and share it on places like GitHub. And at the end, we will have a, we will have time to discuss also to give you practical advice of like how much Git is really necessary, where to start, um, and what are typical pitfalls, what to avoid as you progress from beginner to um, more advanced use. So that's the plan for today. What was the most challenging thing yesterday? Do you think? Yeah, I would like to know from, from learners. So please let us also know what, is there anything that you would like to have clarified from yesterday? Because we can, we have time for recap. We can connect to yesterday. So please let us know. We will be watching these questions and we can connect to those. From my perspective, things went relatively well yesterday. Um, but now I want to come back to my question here. Which part did you choose yesterday to interact with Git? So most people used GitHub. Well, in future, we should offer at least our studio in addition. Some learners um, participated using VS Code and command line. <clears throat> Now, the first episode today, so the next 45 minutes, well, they will be about VS Code and command line. So that will be a, this will be a new thing to all the people who voted here, but it, will be a, it might be a little bit repetitive for those who voted, who used VS Code and command line yesterday. So for those of you who used VS Code and the command line yesterday, there will still be, there will be something new. We will understand what cloning means. But if during the exercise you feel like hmm, this feels repetitive, I know how to do this, then I encourage you to explore some of the optional episodes. For instance, undoing and recovering from typical mistakes. This is an optional episode which we will not cover in, in the mainstream here. So if, so if the first exercise feels a little bit too repetitive for you, maybe use the time to either look at an optional episode or use the time to help answering some questions that other people might have. So you can also help us uh, with, with answering questions. But now I think it's a good time to navigate to the first thing we want to do today, cloning a Git repository. And I will also paste the link in the notes so that you know where to find us. We are here and somebody can then help me reformatting it. It will be, thank you. So always at the bottom of the document, you can, you can find where we are.
Yeah, we should. I think one thing that was a little bit challenging yesterday was that we didn't really clarify so much. We didn't spend much time explaining which track to use. Right. Yeah. And today, again, mostly there will be three tracks. For the first exercise, for the first episode, if you haven't used VS Code and if you haven't used command line, I think I recommend maybe starting with VS Code. It is less to set up and it's maybe easier, easier starting point. The command line is there for those who already use the command line and are familiar with it and would like to stay in the command line and not, not go to a, an additional tool. Yeah, good. <laughs> Objective for now. Objective for the next 45 minutes is we want to be able to clone a repository and we also want to understand what cloning even means. And now we, I really like how Richard yesterday rephrased things in terms of roles. So the role that I imagine now that I'm in is I'm a student researcher staff who found an interesting project which does almost what I wanted. I need to do some small modifications to it. And the thing I want to do now is I want to be able to copy it to my computer with, with the project history. And I would like to be able to do commits locally on my computer. And later, maybe I want to share these changes back to GitHub, but I will do that only later. And by later, it will be in two and a half hours. And what we want to show you is that all the things that we did yesterday, we can also do locally. Things like making commits, making branches, merging branches, and all of it will stay on our laptops or desktops. And we will get a bit of a feeling what it means, what is a remote repository, but it will only give us a feeling. We will spend a lot more on remote repositories tomorrow when we do collaboration. And here is a sketch of what our goal is. And we will first explain it and then send you soon into a 25 minute exercise because we will give you a bit more time because it might require some configuration setup installation for those who haven't done it earlier. A, a clone, that's a copy, right? It's uh... Yeah. I'm also looking at your question six, which is, I think, related. So cloning is really copying. And we have been copying repositories yesterday, but yesterday we called it fork. So the yesterday we were forking, and there the copy was within GitHub. It was from CR workshop exercises organization copy into my own user account. But the copy stayed on GitHub. Cloning is very similar. But instead of making the copy on GitHub from one place to another, I make the copy from, for instance, GitHub, GitLab. But this time I clone it to my own computer. But technically it's very similar, which means that when you do this, and we will see that, uh, we copy everything. These little dots here, also all the commits, branches, everything is copied. What, when do you fork and when do you clone? So when do I fork when I want when I if I want to have the copy backed up somewhere on the web, then I fork. I also fork when when I already have an intention that I will probably make a change and probably at some point contribute my change back to the original rep repository. Sometimes I clone if I really just want to use it or I want to make um, some modifications, but I'm at this point, I'm, I'm not sure whether I, I will contribute anything back. But you can change your mind. You can, you can first fork and then you can clone the fork. So cloning is anytime you want to, you need to work on the project locally on your computer, then you will need to, you will need to clone. Right. So it's it's a full copy, it's a full backup. So if 20 people clone your repository, then you have 20 backups. 
but it, you don't see any traces of other clones, do you? No, I don't know who cloned the repository. So I know. Let's go back to our repositories today, CR exercises, and I will go to the one recorded. This was our repository from yesterday. And here I can see that 41 people forked it. That can be interesting because then for your own project, it can be fun to see like who is using it, who is making changes to it. This could be maybe a future collaborator. Maybe they are doing something interesting. And uh, But when you clone the project, I don't know that you cloned it. So it's on your computers and well, I don't know it. The key is all the files, all the commits, all the branches, all the tags, um, everything that's part of the repository gets copied. It's a full backup. And once you create a clone and you have a you have a copy on your computer and we will now make commits to it, it's also good to know that these repositories, they are they are still somehow connected. And the connection is that my local copy remembers where it was cloned from, but the changes don't automatically synchronize. So we will make commits. There will be more dots here at the end of my local repository, but they will not magically travel back to, to GitHub. And we will what later on. The, hmm? What about commits on the central? Uh, where it yeah. cloned from. Same same thing there. So after I created a clone, if there are new commits, they will not automatically come to my computer. Uh, we will then actively pull changes or push changes. So pull whenever I want to update my like local copy and push whenever I want to publish my local commits. And these are also techniques that we will learn later today and a lot more tomorrow. Just having a glimpse here at questions, and I'm so happy to see that we already have like 10 questions in here. So we are on a good average to break the 100 question barrier. Oh, my, my microphone is low, interesting. Thanks for pointing it out. I will adjust. Hopefully it's better now. And please let us know. I will also check our internal chat here. Hmm. Good. Thanks for letting us know. We let us know if it's still problem. Oh, it's all, it wasn't me. It was somebody else. Okay, I'm <laughs> dialing back. Good. But this is exactly what we wanted. Let us know if things are not right. It could also be like font size, visibility, and audio. Question nine, is it possible to merge clone back with original repository pull request? That's a great question. So how about pull requests? And pull requests, they happen then within, within platforms like GitHub or GitLab. So if I, if I make local commits here and I really want to contribute them back, I typically have to go through a fork. So if I'm in the situation and I realize that, oh, these are really good changes, I want to contribute them with a pull request, I will create a fork, push my changes to the fork, and from the fork, I will send a pull request. So what's this exercise about? The exercise will be, again, we designed something so that it makes sense. You can work on your own, you can work in teams. It's Conceptually, this should be similar and familiar, but now we want to then uh, take a repository, and it's it's our example repository from yesterday, and clone it to the computer, and then make some changes locally. And since the changes will be local, well, then there is no web track, there is no GitHub track there. Uh, here we offer, so if I scroll down a little bit, we offer three tracks. Command line, VS Code, also R Studio, and later we have probably even more tracks. And scrolling back up, so what we want people to do is 
maybe you need to do some configuration and installation if you haven't, haven't done that already. So we will give you some minutes for that. And then you need to decide which repository to clone. Should it be your fork or should it be the original, the original recipe book? By original, I mean the one from CR workshop exercises. For this exercise, it doesn't matter. It can be either. If you have a fork, clone the fork. If you don't have it, or you were not here yesterday, or you are unsure, you can also clone the original repository. Both will work. Then you will create a new branch, but you will do it locally. Uh, create a new commit. And we, we also wanted you to, to learn how you switch branches locally, and you can then switch back to main, create a couple of commits there, and also experiment with merging branches locally. And after you've done that, we encourage you to, to compare the graph. By graph, I mean something like this illustration. Compare the graph of commits that you have locally and compare it with the graph that is on GitHub. And you will see that they differ because the commits that you created and the branches you created, you will only see them in your local version. And I think that's quite instructive. And then we also wanted you to test out if you can find, um, so you will see local branches, you will see your main branch and the, and the, the branch that you created, this one here. But we also want you to find out where are the other branches. And by the other branches, I mean, there are five branches on the, in the central repository and whether you can see them. And we have, for all the steps, again, we have a solution and walkthrough. And what we will then do afterwards here with Bjorn is that uh, depending on your questions and uh, we will show some of the things here also live, either, either in VS Code or command line or both. So what we will do now, I will just switch back here to notes and scroll all the way down. That's the place where we look for questions. And this is also the place where you find, here you find where the exercise is. 25 minutes. And in 25 minutes, we will be back here on stream. And please also let us know during the exercise how it's going, whether you finished or it was confusing or you wish there was more time. This helps us to, to adjust. Sounds good. Sounds good. I think you covered it all. Excellent. So then we will be back 53 minutes. So seven minutes before the hour. And then together with Bjorn here, we will answer some questions and show a few things and summarize. But see you in 25 minutes back on stream. Good luck. Good Bye. luck. All right, welcome back everybody. Just taking a few seconds breather after the exercise. Also, thank you for letting us know how it went. I don't know whether this is a representative exit poll, but let us know whether this was doable in the time allocated or whether we, the, you wish there was more time. We saw also on the questions that there, there were some technical problems. Hopefully we'll be able to solve them. And don't worry if you got stuck, it didn't work. Um, we have designed the rest of today so that we can still continue and we will learn new things and it will work out even if this, if this first exercise didn't work. Um, we will show you some of the steps, both on the command line and if we have time, I already have VS Code open here as well. Before I go there, I wanted to say thank you for we also saw that some of the learners are answering questions of other learners. I think that's super cool. And we really encourage that. So thanks a lot for doing that. And my suggestion is that I will now, we switch the screen share to Bjorn.
and we have a look. We will go through some of the steps on on the command line, and then if we have time, I will also try that here on VS Code. And after that, so in roughly 10 minutes, we plan to start a break. So don't worry, the break is coming. OK, Bjorn, take the screen. I'll share my screen. I hope it's in my screen now. Mm -hmm. So I'll uh, work on the command line. So I'll clone the central uh, exercise, uh, which is in the CR workshop exercise namespace. Yeah, and I realized that we made actually a little mistake. We should have cloned the re recorded one, at least us when we show something here. Yeah, do okay. we need to do that? No, I don't think we have. Just that we don't expose any any people anywhere. So we will clone the one, which is the recipe book minus recorded. Uh, do, should I add the recorded yeah. minus yeah. recorded? Yes. It's the same thing. It's the same recipe book, just yeah. but just uh, that's the one that we have been using yesterday on stream. Yeah. Uh, so then I get a copy. I uh, mm -hmm. get uh, a lot of uh, messages from uh, Git here on uh, accessing the remote and mm -hmm. then copying objects to my local storage. Mm -hmm. And then I'll have a subdirectory called CR workshop exercise. Now, uh, recipe book recorded. Uh, you see here two yeah. subdirectories and the recipe book recorded is the one that I cloned now. Mm -hmm. So it will create a new directory with the same name as the repository. Yeah. So I, I could have uh, added uh, um, my own name here at the end, and then I would get, have gotten a, a subdirectory called test, mm -hmm. if, if that was the name. Okay, I'll step into the recipe book recorded and uh, I'll do a git status and see where I am. So I'm on the main branch and uh, nothing to commit the work train tree is clean. And um, you can also try now a git branch to see which branches are there. And, yeah. and there is only the main branch now. Which is maybe a bit surprising because that's but it's the we now we see the local branch. Yeah, so we don't see the remote branches. And uh, the... there is somewhere in the in the exercise step there is also a question about well where are the remote branches and we can see them if we do git branch dash dash remote or if we do git branch dash dash all. This dash dash all. Mm -hmm. Then I get all the remote branches listed. Yes. And we see the uh, name is region. Uh, so th that is uh, what's the the remote repository is named. Yes. So if I do git remote minus v here, I get that the, the alias origin points to the recipe book recorded in the CR workshop exercise namespace on GitHub. Yeah, because earlier, I said that they still, they are connected somehow, uh, and this is the connection, so that our local copy remembers where it was cloned from, and it it adds this. So it the the place where we cloned from is then called uh, origin. And now somebody asked, "All right, so I cloned it, but now how do I modify the files?" Yes, and I'll uh, create a branch here. Mm -hmm. Uh, I use git, I can use git checkout minus b, and then I use my username and add another recipe. Yeah. So that's uh, uh, just a principle that I add my username. So, so uh, 
uh, so others can see if I push this back to the mm -hmm. to the remote, others could see that what I have added as a branch. And what this command did is that you did two things in one go, which is create a new branch and switch to it. And somebody also asked, oh, what is the difference between checkout and switch? They really do the same thing. Uh, traditionally, it was called checkout. There is on more modern Git, you can use switch, and it's a little bit more intuitive to switch between branches. So when I do Git status now, I, I, I lo I'm no longer on the main branch, but at the branch that I created, blindj, another recipe. Yes, and we cannot see the entire width of the window. I don't know if you can make the the one terminal window that we look at, if you can make it a little bit more narrow so it, it spills a little bit over the... Yeah, it wraps around. I think this is maybe, maybe okay enough. What is nice is that below on the other window, we can see the commands that Bjorn has typed. And anyway, we follow the, we follow the material. Yes, so uh, I'll add a new file. Uh, I use the editor nano here and uh, add an, a mains course. Yeah, so you create a new file and here the key point is use your favorite editor, which can be nano is one of the many different editors. We will create a new file or you could modify an existing file. And then in a second step, we will then create a commit. So I'll, just creating a new file or just modifying a file doesn't really create new commits. We will have to do it actively. Control X for answer for saving. And I created a new call file called Fodi, Fodi call MD. And if I do git status now, I'll see that I have an untracked file, which I now have created with the nano editor. Yeah, and for the not Norwegians here, Forikol is a really tasty, one of the national staple dishes in Norway. So I'll do git add mains Forikol, and then git status again. I will see that it's now stored for, staged for being committed. Yeah, and now let's commit it commit is minus m for a message and the message that's the same thing that yesterday i was typing in the the commit message which will be which should explain what we did summarize why we did it and here we do the same thing locally but the commit will now only exist on beyond's computer i cannot see it we cannot see it so now it's committed and um if I do git log minus minus graph minus minus online decorate minus all, I get a list of the commits and I see that I have one commit ahead of the original main. So the long command that, that uh, I used now, it uh, can be created as an alias. The recipe is shown later down on the in the uh, lesson, and it's a very useful useful command to have. Okay, um, then I'll switch back to the main uh, branch. I'll use main this switch this time. So now I'm back on the main branch. And I'll modify one uh, let's see here. I'll modify the tortilla recipe. Uh, and add one teaspoon of salt here and save it and when I do git status oh we can see that the means tortilla is modified 
Um, yep. Do the do the git add for the names for Tila. And uh, it's staged, and then I commit, write a commit message. Add, oops, what happened here? And we are soon out of time here, so a break starts soon, but no stress. Okay. But I think the uh, the important thing was that, uh, yeah, we we clone, modify files, create commits, they live only locally. I think I will maybe not show the VS code uh, just for the sake of time, but we have screenshots. But if the screenshots are not clear enough, please do ask questions and we will answer the questions on the notes. But I suggest we we go to a break. Yeah. I'll and uh, then we can still recap a little bit once we are back. And uh, it will be a 10 minute break. We will be back 15 minutes past the hour and we will also post at the bottom of the notes that it's actually break time so that people know. See you in a bit, 15 minutes past the hour. Have a nice break, bye. All right, we are back. 45 minutes left before we take a little bit longer break, which at least in like Central Europe then aligns with, with lunch break. So that's why we organize it this way. And in the next 45 minutes, we will learn how to navigate in our existing repository. And this, we will do that, it can be done locally or it can be done on the web, web browser. I think before going there, I would like to start with this question, which is excellent. So what would be the main advantage of using the command line over VS Code? And I think instead of VS Code, we could also say over another integrated development environment. Because for somebody who is maybe new to command line, it can be less intuitive and more difficult to navigate, especially when they are new to commands and trying out, figuring out whether it's worth investing into, into command line at all. So I have some thoughts there. I don't know if you want to also comment beyond. Yeah, well, I, I think it's worth uh, you know, learning the command lines uh, commands. But uh, when starting out, it's, it's it's VS Code is very supportive, so you get to do what you intend to do in a very short time. Uh, but in parallel, I, I I think it's worth learning the Git command line commands, so you also can use those. Yeah, I think almost anything people need in like day-to-day -day work can be done in VS Code. Uh, the integration between VS Code and GitHub is excellent. And it's no surprise because, I mean, both of these tools are affiliated with Microsoft. So the integration is really, really good. Uh, with the command line, you have a little bit more flexibility. You can do, but some of these are really advanced things that maybe you need once per year. If, if you want to work on a like high performance computing environment, then it's very often in a command line. And maybe that's a moment then to move to the command line. But if people are completely new to this, it's sometimes just easier to, to use an editor that offers to do it graphically in the same place where you modify the files. Some people like me prefer to have different tools for different situations. So I, I want to have an editor and it just does editing. And then I want to do all the Git stuff. I want to do some somewhere else. So it depends a little bit on preference, but it's important for us to say that the one thing is not better than the other thing. Try something, experiment, and then you can also compare. And that's why also we offer these different tracks. I will now move into this episode here, archaeology, inspecting history. And it's the next one on this page. And this is again something that you can try either, either on GitHub or on the command line or in VS Code. And I think this is really useful for everybody to, uh, we will show you some commands here and we want you to know that they exist. 
And there will be a day when you will remember that, oh yes, there was this command and I was able to do this and this thing. And then you can come back to this page and find how it worked. So just knowing that this is a possibility. And we will put ourselves in a situation where we browse an existing project written by somebody else. We decided to look at this network X project. This is an open source project. It's a Python project, doesn't matter. Um, that does some graph theory and network things. But we will, so now we imagine that we start, uh, I'm a new student, new PhD student, new postdoc, and I'm entering something and somebody else has already written a lot of code and there, are, there is a Git repository and I need to navigate in there. And as a warm up and just for fun, okay, so I want to open up this repository. You can browse it as well. It's, it's on GitHub, 7,000 commits, lots of people contributed there. So I didn't, I have no affiliation with this. I will use it only as an example. And one kind of fun tool is to browse this through this GitHub history XYZ tool. And in here, you can put in any Git, GitHub repository that is public. So you could replace this to buy your own repository and then browse any file. I will just show you how it looks because it's a fun visual way. So this is now we are looking at the readme file of this network X project. And now with left and right arrows on my keyboard, I can now navigate through the history and we really get a, like a visual understanding. But, but mm -hmm. this is a general service from GitHub. It's not connected to the network X repository. So it's, I don't know who wrote it. Uh, somebody wrote it, but uh, you, here you can put in any repository. So right. I could I could put in CR workshop exercises and here could be recipe book and here could be readme MD. And then with left and right arrows, I could kind of do some time traveling and see how the file evolved. This is just for fun, fun to look at. But now I want to go more into the more useful things. And I was wondering now in the break whether I should demonstrate the command line or GitHub. So I would normally personally use command line, but maybe just to challenge myself, I will demonstrate a couple of these tools on GitHub. And then in the, we will give you an exercise block again, and then you can try these tools and we give you a little challenge. So there is a little bit of archeology span work. We ask you a few questions to figure out something about this network X repository and using the tools that I will just demonstrate. And one, one of these things that you can do, and I think we have tried it also yesterday when we looked for which recipes contain the world, which recipes contain salt, is that you can search, you can search in recipe, in repositories. And on, <clears throat> we have uh, instructions on how to do it in command line. You can, if you want, you can now test it in a command line, but I will otherwise just watch what I do. I will now search something in here. And you can search for, for instance, fix me. What are all the places that this can be useful because um, sometimes I leave these fix me's in my own projects to remember to fix something. And it will list here all the files that contain this. And then you can, and then you can browse these files. So I could click on one of these files and browse them. So searching through repositories. And there is also then a command line version of it. Really, really useful. I use it if, for instance, I get an error message from a code and I want to know where in the code does it come from. So then I search for the error message. Uh, when you search, you, you must have the repo and the and the repository name. So yeah. you search with the repo and not uh, the whole GitHub. Yeah, and when I did that here, so when I visited this repo and I clicked on the magnifying glass, it it automatically suggests this, but I could replace it. I could search some other repository. Oh, but the key is that 
you can search through the entire repository through the present version of it. There are also ways that you can I can search through the whole the past. So even if something got removed in the past, it's also possible. The next thing I wanted to show you is that if you that you can browse specific commits. Oh, I could click on any of these commits and uh, browse the details of these commits, both what was the change and what is the metadata. If you know a commit identifier, and in this case it's 759D5 long number, you can also put in put it in directly. So let's remember that 759D58. So I could also do it. 759D58. I don't even have to type the whole thing. And this way you can look at any of the commits uh, in, um, in the repository. And there you can do the same thing then on the command line. The line by line annotation, it's super powerful. On the command line, it's called git annotate. On GitLab, it's called annotate. On GitHub, it's unfortunately called blame. But it's so super useful not to blame anybody, but to to find line by line annotation. So here I can switch between looking at the code or looking at the code and the annotation. And later in the exercise, we will ask you to find a specific line in a code and then to find out which commit was the one that modified it last. We will also ask you to. Can you bring, okay, oh, imagine that you find a problem, you find a bug in the code, and then you find out when was it last modified. And then you want to know how did the code look just before I introduced the bug. So what you want to know is what was, what was the commit just before the problematic commit. And yesterday I learned that there is, and I learned it from somebody on writing on the notes is that there is this blame prior to change feature here. And with this one, you can navigate to the version just before, and you will use that in the exercise. Mm -hmm. There's a question on uh, the share notes. How do I find the commit overview on the GitHub page? Oh, the upper part is blocked. Sorry for that. Let me show that again. Uh, I will make it less blocked. I will. Well, let's hide this one. Ah, I, doesn't matter. I unblocked it already. Okay. So let's go back to. I'm back at the repository. And sorry, what I wanted to show is this. We are back at this GitHub repository. And the way I found, if I understood the question correctly, uh, all the commits was to click here on the clock symbol. On the command line, this would be git log. Show me all, all the commits that existed and it will show you 7,000 commits. And maybe one more tool that is really useful. Let's say that I I met a specific commit. I found I'm looking at this commit here, which changed some integers instead of strings. And we have the change. Some files got lines got removed, some lines got added metadata, but a really cool feature is what if I want to look at the project as it looked, not just this change, but I want to look at the whole project, but at this commit. So how was it on, how did the project look on September 12, 2016? And you can do that here, browse files. So in top left, I will zoom in a little bit. 
it doesn't say main anymore or master, but it it shows now I'm looking at the project as it was in at the commit with this identifier, which was in 2016. And you can you can then do some archaeology in there. So question 33. Let's see what so these red squares and green squares, maybe is this one here? I think this is a visual representation of how much got removed and how much got added. Just a short summary. So this is some, some tools and uh, there is no expectation that now you remembered all the steps I did. The nice thing is that we have here, we have step-by-step -step solution and you can then also use these screenshots that we have and you can use the command line recipes and uh, and I will come back to question 34 in a moment, but during the exercise, we will have 20 minutes, you will explore this um, repository, which is, which is not something we created. So here, the first steps will be to make sure that you are not still in the same recipe book from this morning, but so we will navigate out of it. We will create a new, if you work locally, you will create a new clone. And then your tasks are, okay, in this project that we don't know, we somewhere in the code, there is a file which contains a line and the line says logic error in degree correlation. And we imagine that we are running this thing and we got the error message. And now we need to know more about why is the error there? Can I do something about it? Where in the code does it happen? So your, your task is to find where in the code does this happen? And then when was this line modified last or edit? So find the actual commit and inspect the commit. And when you inspect the commit, and this connects also to question 33, you don't need to type the entire long identifier for the characters. It's enough to have maybe six or seven if they are unique. So you will look at what is actually in the commit, what is the commit change, what is the commit metadata, and then try to create a branch that points to the past when that commit was created. So uh, our goal is to browse the project as it looked back then a few years ago and think a little bit how we how would you bring the code back to the version of the code just before that line got modified and i showed you how how to do that on github but it's also possible to do it on the command line okay somebody's operating a heavy machinery outside i hope you cannot hear it on the microphone but let me know if you can i think it's good I good i knew your voice we're here good and i'm just Checking here questions whether we should clarify anything else before sending people to into a 20 minute exercise. How can you find know the hash of the code? So you may be, um, uh, maybe here somebody means the hash of the commit. Um, have a look at some of the hints and steps and it will hopefully become clear, but if not, we will clarify more. So thanks a lot for pasting here. Somebody prepares already the, the exercise block. During the exercise block, we we are silent on stream and your goal will be to explore these five questions. You will need to start by, if you work locally, you need to start by cloning the repository, but it's possible to do everything on GitHub and then you don't need to clone anything. And down here, I will click on it, but I will also close it quickly. Spoiler alert, there is some solution. And the solution is here for the command line and GitHub but you can contribute additional solutions. And then we will be back and we will then use the remaining seven minutes of the hour to discuss some of these reactor questions and, and summarize this session before we start a longer break. Good, let's be back at, uh, here you find where the exercise is. And we will be back at 53 minutes past. I will just type that in, 53.
please continue asking questions or the notes. Good luck with the exercise. See you in 20 minutes. Bye. Bye. Welcome back from the exercise. We have uh, seven minutes left and we were watching your questions and thanks for asking them. We saw that there were quite many questions about the concept of what it, what does it mean to create and browse and edit a local copy. And these are good questions. So we I want to show, we will show that we will, uh, we want to really react to these questions. Um, also somebody else created a Git repository in, in the wrong place. And we will clarify that, uh, how that can happen and where on my hard drive is even the Git repository. So I think this is something we should really clarify. So first thing I want to show, what does it mean to create a local copy on VS Code? And then I want to show what does it mean to create a local copy in, in the command line? And we should also have a discussion about, well, where should people start? Should they start in an editor? Should they start in the command line? Should they avoid all of these things and just use the browser? So we should have a discussion around these questions. But let me start in VS Code. And this is, this is an environment that I'm not familiar with, with. So I will be a little bit clumsy here. but maybe that's helpful. So if I want to work locally, I have opened up on bottom of the half of the screen is VS Code. It looks pretty empty because I opened it up in a, in a folder that, that I called course. And now if I want to have this repository locally, the, what, what I did is I, quit, I switched to the source control tab. And now maybe you needs to help me. How do I find? What about switching uh, to the files? Uh, the... File, but I want to clone. All right, just a sec. <laughs> <laughs> I had that before, but why can't I find it now? So I want to clone now. And I'm now. But the uh, upper left symbol. Oh. oh, it's maybe because I'm so zoomed in. Here, three dots, here we go, clone. I want to make a local copy from where? I will copy it from here, so the green button. And now there was also a question, well, should it be SSH, HTTPS? In this case, it doesn't matter because I will not contribute any changes back. I just want to browse it locally and make changes locally. So I want to copy this, clone. This is the address. And just please do it. And now I think it asks me where to place it. I will place it in the same. Yeah, that's interesting because now it wants to place it in a different place than I am right now. Not in the subdirectory that you were in, the course. No. No, but I will find it. Oh, here we go. So I just need to, now this is, I see that this is outside of your screen, but I'm navigating now to the place where I want it. And now it will put it on, now it's copying it. And what I will be able to see here is that I will be able to see the history and I will be able to then go to each file and make changes to it. Here we go. And this is hard to read because I have, I'm so zoomed in. But this is the uh, this is the project, and I admit I don't know how to browse it because I don't use VS Code so often. But I I know that I have it on my hard drive. Maybe it's here. Oh, here it is. So I navigate it up here, top left, and here are all the files. And now, I mean, now I could go in and make some changes to the file. And this is what it means to create a local copy and make local changes. And this change should also show up somewhere here. And I think this is the place where I can then. Yeah, you have a number one upper left there. It says, it says that. Yeah. Changed one file. What I was hoping is that I can see the change also here and I can commit it. Let's make a commit. Yeah, I can't. I don't know. Yeah, maybe I need to save. 
and I don't even know how to do that. All right, so um, um, control this S, I guess, or something. Now saved. Great demo. Um, I will <laughs> let me show you how to do that on the command line. This is my <laughs> um, this is my this is the environment that I'm more familiar with. And here, if I want to make a local copy, it starts with. Okay, what do I have here? What kind of directories? I, I have this network X from before. So if I want to clone now, git clone, I need to give it a different name because I have already one here. So this is the other network X. And the network X that you have there is from the VS code yeah. cloning. Yeah. So this is a way to create a local copy now in the command line. And, and then, I can go into, into this new directory and I can open files with my favorite editor. And you have all noticed that I have a different favorite editor because I'm not familiar really with VS Code. But the one thing I wanted to show you, which we didn't mention earlier, is that if I now on the command line navigate to, to this repository, and I can see that we are almost out of time, uh, I wanted to show you that uh we'll just switch the order here that there is a there is a hidden directory called dot git and this is the one that contains all the history all the commits and for the people who created maybe a git repository like in the wrong place on your hard drive you can look for this directory all the commits all the branches everything we create goes into here this is the local git repository and every Git repository has this dot .git. You have a dot .git over there. What's that? This is something that came together with uh, Network X. This is something they created, and we will we will see that next week uh, when we do automation to build documentation or run tests. So we are already one minute over time. Um, here the goal was not to remember how these commands work, but we wanted to show you that this is possible. It's possible to browse the history and find what is going on in the repository or, or what has happened in the past. One thing we skipped, but can be a really useful command one day. One day it will save the day, and that is a nice tool that can help you to change to find out when something changed in the past. And there is also an exercise, but that is completely voluntary. Try it, try it out sometime. Um, really useful tool when you are in a situation that you notice that hmm, something changed in my project, but I'm really unsure when exactly. And this tool will find, will locate the precise commit. Good, but since we are out of time, I recommend we take a good 58 minutes break and we will be back in 58 minutes and then there will be then one more exercise block and what we will learn how to do and practice to do is how to turn my own project which is maybe a bunch of files it's not in git yet how do we turn it into a git repository and then share it on github so it will be basically the opposite of what we did this morning and then there will be a half an hour discussion session. Where to start, what traps to avoid. Anything else important I missed that I should raise before we go into break? Is there any questions that you should have covered? I think we will look at questions and we then, can also start uh, the next session with a little recap. Yeah, we can do that. So everybody enjoy 57 minutes break. We will be back, back on stream at the next full hour and do more git. Thanks so much. See you later. Bye. See you later. Bye bye. Welcome back from the break. And how do people like the jingle? So welcome back to more git. We have uh, 90 minutes left. There will be one more break session. Um, roughly in 55 minutes. We want to now 
discuss go a little bit the other way compared to earlier this morning. We want to start with a project that is on my hard drive. Let's imagine it's not on Git yet. How do I make it, turn it into a Git repository? How do I share it so that other people can find it and so that I don't lose it? And you can, it's no problem and encourage to continue asking questions also about previous topics. We will be watching these questions and so there will be one more exercise soon, but first we want to well explain it. And then we will round up this day by having a discussion about really where to start and clarifying some of the things that came up during the day. So for me, the optimal thing to close the session today will be if we get lots of questions, let's see if we, get, we can get to 100 and if the, the last maybe 20, 25 minutes are really like a discussion where we discuss these. So I will now navigate to this next episode, which is about sharing. And it's this one here. I will zoom in. We want to turn my own coding project. It can be small or large. It can be a single script, or it can be a bunch of files finished or unfinished into a Git repository. And let's be honest, um, programming projects never get finished. We always have an idea how to make them nicer next week, next month, next year, but it's good to share them so that so you, they are so findable. So you should do this uh, rather soon when you yeah. start out, really. Yeah, the sooner the better. And I, I remember the first time I uploaded anything to like GitHub, I felt like, now immediately people will start and browse my projects and criticize it and that just doesn't happen it's not a problem to share something unfinished because very often the unfinished thing is the thing we use for our daily work and it's also about backup and we will we will up share this project on github but the, the important point here is not github the important point here is that it's a place that is not my hard drive. And it's a place that other people can access. So that's just, a, just an example. And here is an illustration. So I will start with a bunch of files and I will also show you that because on my hard drive, I, I created two files. That's my example project. And I want I want it, so now I'm convinced that Git is a good, good thing. I want to turn it into a repository and upload it to, to GitHub GitLab. And this can be, it can be your real project, but maybe maybe you are not ready yet for that. It can be a example, silly project that we call my project. So then if you don't have any files yet, you can then during the exercise session create a project with, I don't know, one, two, three files in it. And one thing we should clarify, which I think I didn't do really well in the previous episodes is which track should people use? We have these different tracks using GitHub, VS Code, Command Line, RStudio. And which one do we recommend? Uh, it was maybe confusing that we tried to show multiple tracks here. And our recommendation is that if you are completely new to this, if you haven't used any of these tools before, go for GitHub. This will be the simplest simplest way and I will demonstrate it in a moment and we will see that it takes five minutes. The other tracks go use those if you, if you have used VS Code before and that can mean like yesterday or this morning, um, then you can try that. Command line only if you really either if you, either if you know how to navigate in the command line or if you have somebody somebody who can help you. Maybe you have somebody like a support that you can ask questions. Maybe you have a team a teammate who also uses the command line. Then I would go for these other options. But the goal here is not to try all of them at the same at the same time. Go for the one that sounds familiar, and if none of them sounds familiar, go for this one. 
you can also later try some of the different tracks. After the workshop, you can maybe meet up with somebody else, form a little learning group, and then try some of the some of the other tracks together. This can be really, I think, great learning. And before throwing you into the exercise, I thought that I will here demonstrate what is the absolute minimum that we could do, that I could do to share my work on places like GitHub. And don't worry, I will also show you how you can remove it again so that you don't have to be worried that what we create here is created for eternity. I will share a project and I will show you how I can delete it again. And I will basically follow these screenshots. So I will now, you can just for the moment watch. Continue asking questions. And I will now demonstrate this GitHub track. So track is one of these four. So this is what I refer to as track. I will demonstrate this one. So now just lean back and watch. Later you can try it. I'm I'm now on my GitHub space under my username. And I will create a new empty repository. This is really the simplest way to get anything up here on GitHub. A new repository. And I need to decide where it should be. In this case, it should be under my username. And I can give it a name. How should I call it? My project. My so project. Hopefully, OK, I don't have one yet. If Great. So this is not, doesn't exist yet. I can give it a description. This is just an example. A teaching. It will be public because I want other people to be able to find it and browse it. Of course, if you, if you are uncomfortable with that, now just for the demonstration purposes, you can try this as well. I will take public and I want to start with a readme file, yes, because it will then it will not be an empty repository. It will already, this will create the first commit and there will be a readme file. Will you add a license as well? I think we should do that. So license, good idea. Which one? We don't know. I will take MIT. And what these mean and which one we should choose. And also the fact that there are many more licenses. Uh, we will discuss next Tuesday when we talk about social coding and licensing. I will now go for MIT license. But really good reflex to start immediately with a license because then other people who understand what this license means, they know what they can do with my code. What is this Git ignore? We will discuss this a little bit in our discussion session later. So I have a readme, I have a license, everything looks pretty good. And I will create this. It's an almost empty repository. I said almost because it's a repository where there is a readme, there is a license. And, you, and, and then it's initially committed. So you have your first commit in there. And I have my first commit, exactly. So there is a first commit with this identifier. So if I look at this timeline, the little clock, there is now one commit. And this, this, is, this commit was created by GitHub for me. But now I want to upload my project. And really the simplest way to do that is the plus plus symbol here, which is upload files. And I have already two files on my hard drive. I can now choose them from my hard drive here. You get a I'll get a dialogue, I'll just move it away to not show any secret things, but I will now navigate to, to the place on my hard drive. And here I am, so this is somewhere on my hard drive. There is, here's the My Project. It's not a Git repository yet. And I have two Python files, my script and some module, they do something. And I, Okay, this is maybe not so visible, but I select both and I said, say, yes, I want to upload both. Here they are. And now we need a commit message. Uh, 
I don't know. Yeah, select the text that says there. Saving my, it's maybe not the greatest commit message. We will later discuss what makes a good commit message to scripts and then hear more from now on. Now on, I really want to use Git. This is the initial version. Should it go to main branch? Yes. So this will create a new commit and it will add these two files. Could you have created a branch there? If it... Yes, I could have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here they are on main and I will even, I will post just for fun, I will post it in the collaborative notes. You can browse the, the thing that I just created. It's down here. So, I mean, anybody can now browse it, critique it, improve it. Uh, and that was really my goal. Um, maybe one question, well, how would I go now from here on? Like if I want to now continue, so I said that I really want to continue using it, what would be the next step? And this is not part of the exercise, but what would be the next step from now on? In this case, the next step would be for me to clone the repository to my hard drive again, because then it it is already a Git repository. Because this commit that I created, these two commits, they now only exist on GitHub. They are not they are not on my hard drive. So the next step would be to clone it. Your hard drive is still just a bunch of files. So, yeah. yeah. On my hard drive is still just two files. They are not connected yet. This is a little bit different if you if you choose different tracks. So I don't, know, don't want to now discuss every track individually to not be too confusing, but if you then, the path towards a Git repository out of a bunch of files is different depending on which track you use. But at the end, we have a Git repository that is publicly accessible. Later we will discuss whether having a Git repository here is enough for reproducibility. So that is uh, something for, for later, but this is already not too bad. I also promised that I would show you how to delete it again if you want to get rid of it. For this, I will zoom out. And I, I zoomed out so that I can see the settings on top right, this one, the settings button. And under settings. There, there's a danger zone. Yeah, so there are lots of objects. You can rename the project. You can change the default branch. Lots of things you can you can do here. But if I scroll down, scroll down, suddenly there are some red options. And the red options are you can, I can make it now, I can change it to private or I can do some other things. I can also delete it. So this would be the way to get rid of it again. And this also is a good reminder for me to mention that also the exercise repositories that we created yesterday and repositories that we will collaborate on tomorrow, eventually we will also remove them. So you don't have to be worried that this is held there forever. These things will be deleted. Yeah, good. So exercise will be steps one, two, three. And step one will be create an example project with one or two files, uh, make it a Git repository and sh make it available on GitHub or GitLab because the, the principle is really the same. So if you have, if you rather work on like your university GitLab, then you can try that instead. And we give 25 minutes, which is for some, it will be too long, but then ask us lots of questions, but we really want to give people the time. It would mean that we would be back at 40 minutes past the hour. And then we can have a discussion about these steps, how to go from here, what are all the other things that we missed. So let me copy the exercise to the notes.
the exercise is this one. And it will be until forty minutes past. And we will add here more details and also then again ask for feedback on how things are going. Thanks so much for the questions. Good luck with the exercise. And really looking forward to discussing Git afterwards. See you in 24 minutes. Bye. back from exercise and thanks for letting us know how it went lots of thumbs up here hopefully this was representative for some of you this might have been too much time for this exercise because it, it really depends which which track people choose some people got into trouble but then asked about it and we answered and i really like that we are on the path to break the 100 questions barrier. And it's so cool that we make asking questions a good thing. It's not a problem. It's, a, it's really a feature. So thanks a lot for that. We want to know, I will scroll down and make sure that you find where we are right now. Uh, let me paste in where I want to go. And... Sorry, before I go there, I want it, uh, I want it to. This is where we were. I wanted to comment on something before we move to more discussion format. And that is that yes, now we learned how to publish our work and my work is now here. And the question that I wanted to ask all of us is to reflect a bit whether this is really publishing. And this is down here on, so there is, question for all of us to think about is now is putting software on github gitlab bitbucket does it is this equal to publishing software can i now is it now findable and accessible and the answer is that no but it's already i think this is much better than 80 percent of computation research which never gets published anywhere so at least it's here you can find it uh, what is the problem? The problem is, uh, well, exactly what I was showing before the exercise. I can now go on settings and delete it. Or I can remove my account. And then it will not be findable. So this is a really good first step. Uh, when you publish your work, we recommend to go one step further and to make the work persistent. This here is not a persistent place. And, and it's we will... persistent. It, it's uh, on... Uh related to your namespace or account or yeah so we will next week show you how you can make it persistent you will also make it citable at the same time you will get a digital object identifier and people can cite your code repository and then it's persistent it i cannot delete it and it's then independent of this repository so i can delete the repository i can delete my account but the 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 place where i basically archive the code and a popular service is um, Zenodo. It's only one of one of several services, and this is what we will show you next week, just as a little preview. And depending on which track you used, you have maybe now been exposed to terms like remote and pushing and pulling. So some people have seen it, some people haven't seen it, because it depends whether you which interface you have used. And here I wanted to say that tomorrow we will talk more about these. We will use them for collaboration. So push and pull is really a mechanism now to synchronize changes between, between repositories. And when we talk about remotes, we often it's often a repository like GitHub, but it could be here we list some other popular services that where people share their repositories. But when you talk about push and pull, then you're talking about a remote and a local. So that's how you synchronize between your 
mm -hmm. local copy and the remote copy. Yeah. And then somebody asked, well, how do I get my changes from this one computer that I have to the other computer at the department? And then you can do it also through the remote. I could push my changes here to GitHub. And then as soon as I'm in the other office, I could pull the changes to the other computer. Good. And now I want to navigate you to a, to a discussion session. Let me find it. And the, the question that we want to discuss now in 15 minutes before taking a short break is we, we want to make it really practical. So how much Git is really necessary? We have seen now a few things. Where should we start? This place here. And as usual, you can continue asking questions also about the previous uh, section. I will now navigate to this page. And here we really want to give you some some practical advice to start with. The first one is for people who are on a command line. So maybe I will not, you can, those of you who use the command line, you can read it. Their git status is one of the most useful commands to, this is something I do all the time to see what is happening. But I think I want to navigate to the second question and that is, what are good some good practices to write useful commit messages? Because we have been writing commit messages and some of them that I created, they were less useful than others. And here we want to show you some good examples. So a useful commit message is one that summarizes the change and provides context. And sometimes the summary fits into one line so we, we try to summarize it in one line, but if we need more context, um, so here's an example. If if I create commit messages in on the command line, the first line is the summary. And then if I need more context, the convention is an empty space and then more context here where I can relate to a discussion that we had and I can explain a little bit more why I did something. I emphasize that the first line is important because when I navigate, when I browse repositories on the web, then the first line is the one that I see. This is the first line. So it's good if that one is, it gives a good summary. And the ref reference hmm. to one, two, three there at the bottom of the commit message, that's issue, I guess. So this could refer to an issue with the number 133, where we could read more about this change. Maybe this was something that I suggested somewhere and then we had a discussion, is this a good idea? At some point we realized, yes, this is a good idea. And then half a year later, I come back with, with a commit that implements this and relates back to why I did this and why we did it this way. And the why, is sometimes why something changed is more important than what has changed. So it's good if good if the commit message explains why the motivation for this change. And the this is because you, mm -hmm. the what you have changed is you can see from the log or from the yes. for because here I can click on the commit that I created earlier. What did I change? Well, here it is. This is what I changed. So I can always find out what I did but it might be more difficult to find out why did I do this? So that's why, why? You can cross reference issues, pull requests. Uh, there are some humorous ex bad examples. So somebody compiled just some funny bad examples from other repositories. Um, commit messages in English that will be understood 15 years from now by somebody else because many projects that really became big and popular started as as a little project just for me you can you can create commits with multiple authors because then both or multiple authors get credited for this 
And here we also link to some blog posts that discuss how do good conversations look like. One thing that I like to do sometimes, and maybe that's interesting, is that you could you could browse your favorite project and maybe your favorite project library that you use. Maybe it is listed here, maybe it is not. So these are some popular libraries that I used in in the Python world or for our development. You could also browse how, how do they write comment messages. And you can even com compare that with release notes. Uh, of course, these are big projects. So this can be a good inspiration to, to see how do other projects do it, but also don't let the perfect be the enemy of good enough. Bad commit messages are better than no commits, no commits at all. So over time, you can then try to improve things. Um, don't try to make it too perfect. Important is to get started and try to commit frequently and then yep. develop from there. Good. Next question. Um, we learned that we can have branches and Often it starts with the main branch or master branch, depends how you create a Git repository. So should we have just this one branch? Should we create lots of branches? Do you have a branching philosophy? Yes. So for me, the philosophy is, um, if it's something small, simple, just for me, there is only one branch. If Sometimes I need branches if I want to experiment, but then I try to make them short-lived. So for me, there is only one long-lived branch and that's that one is called main. Every other branch should be as short-lived as possible. So what is that now? Challenging to, from times to times, but yeah. you, you, you get out of sync really because you keep a branch too long. How, how do you how do you typically approach like a new project? Do you start with one branch, many branches? Yeah, create a branch per idea almost. I, um, I create typically very many branches. And I, I don't always uh, keep them short lived, <laughs> which means they get kind of stalled after a while. Question eighty two: What is the difference between branch and tag? Uh, a branch can change and a tag ideally never changes. So tag is really, it's there, it stays next to the commit, it will not move, it marks a milestone. I could, I could mark a milestone also with a branch, but then I would have to be very disciplined to never change that. If we are few people, it's okay if things break sometimes but it's good to implement code review, somebody else looking over my changes. So personally, if I'm like two people, three people, more people, we start using branches and we review them so that we know what's going on and more about that tomorrow. I think the next one is, yeah, it's not only for the command line. So staging and committing can show up also in VS Code. So when you create a commit, you can create it in one step or you can create it in two steps. And the two steps would be stage it first, look at what you have staged and then commit it. It's a way to prepare a commit and um, kind of check it before, before you really make the commit. This helps me personally to prepare commits so that I don't commit unrelated changes. But also here, my recommendation would be not to worry about it too much. Uh, at the beginning, it's good to make a lot of possibly not ideal commits. It's not a problem. And later you can then explore a bit the staging and it will help you creating more well self-contained uh, commits. How large should I commit be? Should I commit at the end of the day, at the end of the week or every five minutes? 
I often commit at the end of the day. Something that I would not like to lose. Better too many than, than too few. I think a good size of a commit would be something that, like if you want to undo it, what would be a good size of undoing? And this again, don't not putting unrelated things into the same commit because then if I want to undo the one thing without the other, it's possible to split commits, but it's really much easier to combine them. So make many commits. Start simple. Grow your project. I think 83 question is very interesting. Is it a good practice to commit broken code just to save it? So what would I do at the end of the day? And it's not working yet, it's almost working, but I still want to save it. Well, I would maybe put it on a branch, create a branch, commit it there, then it cannot get lost. And then oh, next day oh. I can pick up from there. I would uh, rather stash it. You have, don't go through stashing, but stashing is a mechanism for saving work that you have done. Are you stashing? I want to, but stashing would only then stay still on my like laptop, or at least with yeah, committing, right. putting it on a branch, I can yeah. like back it up. And sometimes I stash, you so you can stash away some work. Sometimes I forget that I stashed it and then I remove the repository. So I, I would maybe create a branch and commit it, but it's nice that there are so many different ways of, of doing it. Um, mm -hmm. How about we take a 10 minute break? Because then we can think about more questions that come up. We will, we also have more discussion for you on typical things to avoid. So some typical pitfalls when you start working with Git or GitHub. So we will discuss that after the break. And you can then think about more questions and, uh, and add them. So the rest of the rest of today, the remaining half an hour will really be discussion and maybe we'll show something if if uh, somebody asks to to demonstrate a step or two we also have a bonus demo that we will maybe show some some feature that we didn't show yet so stay tuned see you in 10 minutes and we return at seven minutes past the hour see you there keep the questions coming but also Take a break. Bye. Bye. And we are back. Uh, 20 minutes left in this session and we will use it for to really discuss and clarify um, some of the really good questions that we got. And we are trying something new. So my colleagues are helping me to mark some questions with this little microphone emoji because that makes it easier for us to see here which questions we should really discuss here on on stream because they are of really general interest general understanding and we will then so i want to answer a couple of those we will then move on move on to also discussing some typical pitfalls to avoid but maybe let's start with the question 84 and the question 84 is can we can we explain again what is the difference between git and github or gitlab and I will, to answer this question, I will open this example project that I published a little bit earlier. I will open it both on my computer, the bottom half of the screen and on, on GitHub. And really the difference is that, so on, on my local Git repository, I will do Git log, which shows me that there are two commits and I can browse them and it's the same commits that that I see here on on GitHub. So what is Git? Git is a tool, it's a program which can do this, which can do this, which can create snapshots with metadata, which can create branches, which can merge branches and where I can synchronize changes between repositories. There is no account there is a configuration so somewhere i have configured my git to that this to use this as my email address and this is my name 
and this will end up in these commit messages. And in our material, we also show you how you can how you can change this configuration. Now, what is GitHub? GitHub is so the same thing is is on GitHub. So GitHub is there is also the same Git repositories there. If I do So now I have my files, readme, license. The, this is the Git repository. This is where the commits are stored. And the same .git is somewhere there also on GitHub. But GitHub has a little bit more. It has also, not only it allows me to browse the commits online, it also implements issues and discussions and pull requests and some extra automation. We will come back to it next week. So you can look at it as something around Git. Git and some extra features and web interface. And really the same thing I could say about GitLab. It's also a web interface to a Git repository with some extra features like discussions, issues, and some more metadata. So, so it's a kind of project support around a project. Yep. And it's a really good question because um, we will also see that it's very, very easy to move Git repositories from one, one place to another. But one thing that is a little bit more difficult to move are then all these discussions, the project around it, the issues, the discussions. And that's why it's important within your project that you have a discussion and you decide, well, do we want to have our project on our university server or do we want to have it on the public GitHub or on my own computer. So hopefully this was an answer. Let's see if we have more microphones here. I think the same question was later. 86. Yeah, Git versus GitHub, GitLab, we have clarified it. There was one at 78. 78. Here, what is the proper way to delete a Git folder? Um, hmm. But the way I would do it is, I would be a little bit worried to, if I delete this part here, then my local Git repository is deleted. It means the, the history is gone. The files are still there. The way I would do it, I would maybe not delete it. I would rename it. And I rename it to uh, git repo to be deleted. Because then if I realize that this was a mistake, I can rename it back. And if I now so, try to do a git log, uh, git doesn't see it now anymore. Uh, git doesn't think that, well, this is not a git repository. I don't, there are a couple of files here, but, and if I rename it back, so this is how I would do it, you know, like safely. And then as soon, as soon as I know that this is really what I wanted to delete, then I, you can delete it. I will come back to some of the microphone questions. Uh, I wanted to navigate us to the, to the section what to avoid. Typical, typical problems, what are they? And so that you can find the section, I will also paste it here. What to avoid. And the first one we talked about, so it's better to, in the commit messages, it's better to explain why something has been done rather than what exactly has been done, because that is, you can always find out from the change. Uh, this one here, we didn't talk about it all. Committing generated files. This could be generated images. It could be if you run Python, maybe you have seen a directory called underscore underscore pycache underscore underscore. Files that are easily and quickly generated by your scripts. PDFs, if you write mm -hmm. LaTeX. Yeah, so there are some files that maybe you don't want to add to a Git repository. 
or it could be something that contains passwords. Definitely, I don't want it. To, it it should not go into a Git repository. Sensitive things. So then you can you can list the file names or the directories or the pattern in files called in a file called dot git ignore. And here you can read more about them and you can even see some templates. So if you create such a file and you list whatever you want git to ignore, it will ignore it. It will not see it. You cannot accidentally commit it. So the anything git, that is sensitive or generated. The git ignore templates are very good. They are for different languages, C++ and mm -hmm. Python. And... Yeah. So they are linked here. Uh, huge files. Uh, Git is really good at tracking text files, code, scripts. Uh, if I wanted to commit big movies, gigantic images, big binary files, then then Git is not the right place. And sometimes in your code, you need to use data that is gigantic, but then then you can keep the data somewhere else on a data repository place and then refer to it from the Git repository. Also good to know that if I accidentally add something and commit it, and later I remove it, I don't remove it from the history. So if I accidentally added some passwords in the history and later I realized it was a mistake and I remove it, you, you, I can still find it in the history. It is possible to also remove commits from the history. Just that you know that th this this can be an issue, it can be fixed. But the idea of Git is that we don't edit, accidentally edit commits in the past. I think we talked about this before. Yeah, it's good not to postpone commits until they will get beautiful. It's better to just commit them, maybe on a side branch. Uh, committing unrelated things together is at some point a problem. It's okay at the beginning. Back to questions. Oh, here we are. Sorry, I'm in the wrong place. What to avoid? Yeah, generated files, for instance, when you work with Conda. So then the thing that should be in the repository is the file that describes the environment. Files like environment.yaml, but the environment itself, so the installed packages, they would then not, they, I should ignore those. There was some other microphone thing that we should talk about in on stream, which is discuss a little bit again, the difference between GitHub, VS Code, command line tracks, how they relate, where to start. So small, easy things uh, you can do directly on GitHub. Anything like having discussions, reviewing code can all be done on GitHub. As soon as I want to do something more than just a minimal change, I personally like to work locally first, reviewing the changes locally, and then I publish them. And I think then you then people will have to make a choice between an editor, and there are many, uh, or using the command line. And also command line, there are actually several to choose from, but there is then one command line git. It is also possible, it's possible to do, to create issues and pull requests and code review. It's possible to do also that from the command line. We didn't show that, but there are, you can do almost everything from the command line. Uh, for a beginner, I think VS Code is an easier starting point than the command line. But if you use a different editor, for instance, Spider or RStudio, there is no reason to move out of it. Uh, it we we didn't show how to integrate RStudio with, we, we didn't emphasize how to integrate RStudio with like GitHub, but it's possible. And um, you can then stay in the editor environment that you typically work in and chances are high that you can use Git from that environment. 
yes we we chose to use to work mostly on github because we wanted you to to see the concepts and hopefully yeah understand the concepts but then you can choose your favorite interface to it not sure we will have time for this one we have no 10 minutes left what i also want to do to not forget is to use the remaining time to give us feedback tell us what what went well and what what should be improved same as yesterday this was really valuable to us maybe we can use the remaining time for that feedback and give an outlook on what to expect tomorrow or is there a like a microphone emoji that i missed that we should raise to the to stream just browsing questions hello So while people fill out the feedback, maybe let's have a look on what to expect for tomorrow. Uh, I will try to find. Yeah, so what do people need to prepare for tomorrow? Tomorrow is, so we are just concluding day two. Tomorrow we will do collaboration. So we will take distributed version control. Yeah, we will take this really to the next level. Work together again on cooking recipes. We will call we will learn how to collaborate within the same repository across repositories. Some of the building blocks we already know from day one. Uh, here the focus will be more about how to do the code review and a closer look at some of the mechanics that we just brushed over. The thing to prepare is, um, so it's possible to do all of tomorrow purely on GitHub. So if if you don't have an editor set up or command line setup is not a problem, you can do everything on GitHub tomorrow. Uh, but what is important to set up is that since we want to do collaboration those of you who are participating as a team as a classroom or a team you can work together within the same exercise repository and uh, you will have the chance to set it up tomorrow but those of you who are participating on your own and would like to practice collaboration and collaborate with others and collaborate with us on stream uh, you can and hopefully you got an email about it so you got an, you got an email yesterday there is uh, you will need to do one relatively simple thing and this is to tell us uh, i don't know what i can now I'll like open the yeah actually i can open the email because i can show you one one thing i can show you is that on the workshop page on top right is the tab communication and there you can find emails that we have been sending out. And we do this because we know that there are participants that, who join later. And the one that we sent out yesterday is this one, preparation for day three. I will navigate to it. Okay, there's something wrong with the navigation, but it's down here. So if you, if you are on your own, but you would like to collaborate with others and with us on stream, you know you need to do this relatively simple step and then we then we can add you to um exercise repository that we will use tomorrow so that's important to prepare Okay, so 
yeah, I is what I wrote under the news here accurate then? If you scroll up a bit. Oh. Yeah. Just looking at the question and feedback, something we can already comment on right now. Yeah, I'll get bisect, we didn't have time. But I think we have some past recordings on it, don't we? Yeah, I think I remember in past years, we sort of did it at the end of a mm -hmm. workshop. Like maybe we did it after the official time ended. Mm -hmm. And then I inserted the video into the right place. Okay. Yeah, and also good to remark that for the people who used to be a scout yesterday come online, there was a little bit of repetition and that's a hard to avoid compromise that we chose to do. But maybe what we should then do is to offer some additional exercises for those who are already familiar to these tools. Otherwise, I'm happy if we can, of course, talk more. Maybe it's not a problem to end four minutes before the end. Yeah. I point out under feedback, um, there's a new part here. What part of the course format do you value most? So we have lots of discussions going on here. Like how do we, like where should we focus our time and effort? So we, well, it's a lot of, time to put on these courses would for example would videos be a okay replacement is us talking live the most important part and so on so please answer there some and that'll help us figure out how to adjust things oh maybe i should add exercises here as an option. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah these surveys a lot. really do help us. Um, yeah, also good feedback, we need more for our studio. Mm -hmm. If you know anyone that knows our studio, get in touch with us and we can, they can help us, so. We can do it ourselves, but there's an expert that helps. Okay, well, I guess um, yeah. Thanks, everybody. So I think this with this we can conclude today's session. Hopefully, we learn something new. Yeah. Thanks so much for all the questions. Thanks to all the helpers and people involved both here on video, but also off video, people answering questions and making the local classrooms possible. And, and all of the other work. Audience. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. See you tomorrow. Okay. See you tomorrow. Bye. 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 Do you want to do the Git bisect exercise now and record it or? Should we just post it? I think the pre videos from last year's are fine, so yeah, I can find. I mean, it. I'm happy to, but I think we have it. Yeah. Okay. Great. Bye.